You're listening to The Broken Meeple Show, a podcast that speaks passionately about board games for the benefit of those who play them. My name's Luke Hector, best known for The Broken Meeple YouTube channel, and I'm an everyday gamer just like you. And I'll be talking about reviews, top tens, and just about anything that connects me to board games. As long as I have a tea or coffee in hand, that is. So grab a cup, relax, and enjoy. And remember, it's only a game. Hi folks, welcome to another Broken Meeple episode, the 28th of April 2024. This is episode 92, I believe. We're slowly creeping towards the 100 mark. I wonder what I'm going to do for the 100th episode. I have no idea. I'm not usually a massive fan of these whole, like, it's our 50th episode, it's our 100th episode bonanza special thing. I don't know, but uh, maybe I'll think of something to do around there. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to decide, or maybe you can give me some ideas on that front. So, yeah, generally things are fine. I mean, work is tedious and mediocre as it typically always is but uh you know soldier on everything you know you've got to get a paycheck from somewhere in order to make sure this happens uh but health wise generally fine no acid reflux issues uh you know the, the pills do their job a lack of caffeine does their job although i did have a caffeinated coffee yesterday it's the first one i have had since november you know since then i have been on decaf all the time along with herbal teas but yesterday i just felt too tired i was in a game of hegemony and i had to teach the game as well more on that in a minute um and it was you know i kind of just needed that little pick me up but it was one one you know, travel cup full of coffee. That was it. And then I didn't have any more for the rest of the day. And it didn't really affect me that much, you know, in terms of like, you know, acid reflux or anything. So I think that I think my body has now got to the stage where it's like it can handle some of the stuff that was causing the reflux before, providing I just don't indulge on it. And to be honest, coffee was the thing I indulged on the most. I still drink a lot of coffee, but it's always decaf, or at least 99 now, 99.9% .9 now decaf. But it you know, I used to have like five, six cups of coffee a day at work. I mean, it could be, I don't think it was ever more, it could be less, but you know, that was a daily thing. I would drink it throughout the day and it would be full on caffeine. And so I think that was the biggest thing that contributed to the acid reflux issues. So the fact that now that that has been curbed and moderated along with other stuff like drinking plant-based milk and not having tomatoes as often as normal, uh, not having citrus uh, stuff as often as I used to, you know, just curbing those sort of things, I think it's doing a decent enough job. And I do eat a lot of uh, things like bananas and almonds and, you know, other little foods and like yogurt, you know, stuff that's actually designed to soothe acid reflux. So, yeah, I think it's combating it pretty well. And at least it's made my throat a bit better. I mean, I still can't, I, I think it's kind of a permanent thing that I can only talk for so long before my throat dries out. That's just normal. Hence, I always have a, you know, a tea or, you know, a drink or something at hand, mint tea today. But I, don't, I think that's just a permanent thing. But at least it's not like scorched earth, you know. I think I'm getting a lot better on that front. So, yeah, it's just nice that that is progressing the way it is. Other than that, uh, you know, wrists, not too bad. <laughs> a little bit of a repetitive strain from, you know, typing on keyboards and stuff like that for work. Uh, but that seems to be slowly but surely healing. Um, it manifests a lot more in the top muscles of your hand. I think they're called the... Uh, flexor muscles or something you know you you feel them when you you know put your if you put your palm down on the table and then try and lift each finger like one by one that those muscles that you feel in the back of your hand that's kind of I think what's a problem with my left re left hand at the moment but you know it is healing I'm seeing physio so that should that'll mitigate in time it's just it takes a good few months for wrist injuries and like you know muscular injuries to heal properly it's just you know not just the fact of getting past 40 years old, which I've, you know, had that, been there, done that, and, you know, moving on. But also, I think just uh, the older you get, <laughs> the more your body just wants to give out. Uh, so gaming-wise, what have we got? Well, you know, the channel itself, not too bad, although, you know, 23, 2, 3, 4, so it's climbing. But lately, not a lot of content, I admit. There just hasn't been a huge amount to do, and I've been quite busy. I've had, like, HandyCon recently, uh, which I thought I was actually going to do this podcast on HandyCon, but I uh, guess not. I mean, it, it, like I say, I, I talk about it a lot anyway, so I don't think there was much else to say other than I had fun. It was good. Saw lots of nice people. Some people said hi. A uh, very kind uh, gentleman gave me a copy of Nyet um, after buying one of my games because he listened to the podcast. So, John, thank you very much for that. I am so, so grateful. That is going to sit on my shelf for some time. Uh, but, yeah, it was a good conventional route. 
Um, but yeah, video-wise, there just hasn't been much. I mean, I still have to do the Moonraker videos, so that's... You know, I've played the game enough to do the reviews. I just need to now actually record and edit them. Um, the patrons have voted on top 10 um, design issues, or was it? Like, I forget what I called it, but basically irritating design choices. You know, to, so to sort of put it another way, it's like top 10, top 10 things I wish designers would stop doing in games. You know, so they voted on that list. So that will be the next top 10 that I look at as well. But then I also do have some uh, other games that I need to look at soon. I mean, uh, the uh, main one to look at is Canvas. Uh, Canvas uh, is a very light game. It looks very pretty. I know very little about how it plays. I know it's super light. I'm fine with a light game, but I've always never had the chance to play it. Not many people I know own it. Every time it's been offered, I've always been doing something else. So I've now, thanks to Kienda, you know, so you know, Kienda Games, who sponsors the channel, they have sent me Canvas along with Reflections and whatever the second um, expansion is. I forget what it's called. Uh, what's it called? Uh, let's see, Canvas Finishing Touches. Yeah, so Reflections and Finishing Touches and Normal Canvas. So I've got the entire game series to review. So that's probably going to have to be similar to Moonraker's where I do a kind of like a review of the base game and then a review of a uh, beyond the base game review of the expansions. That will take a little bit of time because I've still got to do the Moonraker's one, but I think that's my focus for the next few like few weeks, you know, for for at least the first bit of May. I need to do the Moonraker videos, I need to do the Canvas videos, and I need to do that top 10. I think that is priority right now. Although I was supposed to be getting the prototype for Earth um, Abundance, you know, the expansion. Uh, so that's been going pretty strong on Kickstarter. And of course, I'm definitely interested in, uh, you know, grabbing that. But the problem was, was that I was supposed to get a prototype copy to do a review for uh, before, you know, the Kickstarter aired or before at least it finished. But you know, I chased them up and apparently it had been shipped, but still in transit, like it's kind of lost to the aphors of time. So I'm hoping, um, oh, actually, no, I think it was something like they, they didn't ship it. I think that I think I was told it shipped, but then they didn't ship it. And, you know, for various reasons, because I said that I was busy on my 40th birthday holiday and stuff. And I think they were going to ship it after, but they forgot to. So I think it's going to be one of those things where I'm not going to be able to tell you my thoughts on the expansion before the Kickstarter finishes. I just don't think there'll be enough time by the time it arrives. I mean, it's the 28th of April and it still hasn't, it's still not in my house. But I guarantee you, when it does, I will give my thoughts on it. You know, I will give honest thoughts on the expansion because I've got people who are literally tearing my shirt off in order to get this played. Like, they want me to tell them what this is like and they want to be involved in the play. So... Yeah, getting this one, giving this one the beans is not going to take very long at all. I mean, solo and multiplayer, people will rush to my game to play this. So I will give my thoughts, just you might have to accept the Kickstarter might have ended by the time it does. That's just the way it is. I mean, it's a shame. I would have liked to have got it earlier, but mm, can't always help it. Yeah, that's just the way it is. So what else have I got to mention on the channel front? Where's my... Ah, I've lost the page. Where's it going? Page. Come back. Here we go. So we've got what content I did have. So I've done a small review on the Nikosu Dice, which was a trick-taking dice game that I absolutely adore. I mean, I gave this, a, you know, spoiler alert, I gave it a 10 out of 10. This is a probably the best trick-taking game I've ever played. And you can check out that video to know why. I'm actually kind of surprised it's doing as well as it is. 2,300 views. I mean, it's been a while. It's been since, it's been over 10 days, but I was expecting nobody to really give a monkeys about this game, but apparently people did. So I'm kind of surprised by that, especially as Fractured Sky from Ivy Studios, which I reviewed shortly after, um, is only on 2,000 views, and that's since April 23rd. I mean, you know, I was expecting that one to get more of a following than the other game. But the thing that makes me a little bit sad is that I know I'm a bit late to this party, but I finally finished Pandemic Legacy Season 0 with a group of friends. We have finally done it. It is over. I can now move on from everything that is to do with Pandemic Legacy. And I have my thoughts on what zero, Season 0 is like compared to Season 1 and 2. And I've done a spoiler and a non-spoiler overview video of my thoughts. Neither of which has managed to even top a 1,000 views. In fact, one of them isn't even... The spoiler thoughts aren't even aren't even topping 500. That's pretty poor. I mean, and there are some people that dislike the videos as well. I mean, you know, again, I don't say I don't get too fussed about the dislikes, but still, it's like, 
What's there to dislike? But yeah, uh, those two I was hoping would be a bit more popular because I know they're a bit more rushed than other videos I've done. Like they don't have a lot of video clips in them. They don't have the full editing like a normal review. It was basically a quick review. It was just like, look, I've played it. I just want to give my thoughts and move on to stuff that I need to get going because, you know, this is quite late to the party. But yeah, if you can check out the Pandemic Legacy Season uh, 0 videos, that would be appreciated. But yeah, I'm kind of surprised that not a lot of people are. I mean, maybe just because everyone's played it to death, so there's not much to review. Uh, but yeah, I would have thought Pandemic Legacy Season 0 would have been a much more popular game. I mean, certainly compared to something like the Kosu Dice, uh, maybe it's one of those uh, flash in the pan effects. You know, you. I mean, this is the way of the board game industry. A game that is popular at the time it comes out has a very short half-life. And for the most part, by the time it's a year later, will just be quickly forgotten like nobody will give a monkeys about it anymore and with legacy games that's kind of a big deal i mean you know ticket to ride legacy everybody was going on about that uh, at first you know like oh yeah this is going to be fantastic i gave it a below average rating i was really disappointed by ticket to ride legacy but even when you've got some people who love it to death is anybody talking about it right now i've not seen photos on social media nobody's really done any extra reviews of it it just seems to have faded out of everybody's consciousness. That came out at Essen last year. It's less than half a year old. And it's like, nobody cares anymore. So, I think legacy games have that problem anyway. Maybe there should be a video, maybe I should do a podcast topic on those sort of games. But it's you know, just one of those, it just happens. Yeah, nobody's kind of watching it. So, yeah, not a lot of content. I admit, it's been an April, I've been very busy. But May should be able to get back on track because May is full of bank holidays, which is always good, and I don't have any plans until UK Games Expo. So yes, I'll be at the UK Games Expo. I need to actually see if I can do some volunteering at the Expo as well. Not for the Games Expo itself, but I want to help out a publisher, but I haven't really had the time to go out and like extend my hand to a few. I mean, I, I mean Flat River Group might take me back if they want to, but I kind of want to vary things up a bit. I mean, I don't know, maybe the guys at Hegemonic Project Games, are they going to be there? Uh, if you're watching this, you know, if you've got room for somebody who, who's going to give you a hand teaching hegemony or setting up the stall and stuff like that, maybe on the Wednesday before the press event and things, you know, uh, talk to me. I might be interested. Uh, you know, I, I, I would certainly like to do a few hours volunteering to mitigate the cost of going to the expo because as much as I do enjoy going to the Games Expo, it's not the most cost efficient of the conventions. You know, Essen costs a lot of money, you know, to stay there for nearly a week and go to Germany. But you get a lot done there. You get a lot of games. You get a lot of stuff played. You get, you know, like demos at the convention and that. But you also meet a ton of the publishers. Everybody in my world, like the, the content creator world, is there. Whereas the Games Expo is a much more secluded comparison. And yet it still seems to cost about as much to do so. So it, it, mm, there is that. And, I mean, I go to the Games Expo mainly to socialize, play a few games with people who watch the channel and, uh, you know, who publishers and content creators. But I don't really go there to buy or test new games because not a lot of new hotness games come out at the UK Games Expo. It's usually indie publishers and I don't tend to play a ton of those games. So I have limited scope to do anything around the trade show itself. Hence I've got some time to do some volunteering if need be. But yeah, I mean the Games Expo is a good time if you want to catch me for you know, just a chat or play games or something, you know, because I do, I do tend to take it easy at the Games Expo. It's, there's, there's only so much to report on. And so it's a very, compared to Essen, where I've got to make appointments and rush around all over the place. And it's like a, you know, 10 miles, 10 miles, square miles or whatever of stuff to walk around. Games Expo is a lot smaller by comparison. It doesn't take long to get from A to B. And so it's a lot easier to kind of just meet you guys there. Hmm. That's been a mint tea. All right. Anyway, that being said, let's move on with some uh, extra bits. So uh, I want to talk about the game I played literally on Friday night. Um, this is a very dry, and certainly given the topic I'm going to talk about in this podcast is kind of a bit of a, a weird 180. But this is Forenza. Uh, a friend of mine has this. So specifically the anniversary edition, the 2020 version is what we played. Uh, my friend has this. He likes pretty much any game that is set in Renaissance Italy that has Latin names, that is dry as a bone, that is beige as all get out. It's his style of games. 
And surprisingly, I actually figured, you know what, I'll give this one a try. I like to try new games outside my comfort zone every now and again. And I was told that this one had, you know, worker placement spots that other players created that you could go to. And it's like, that sounded pretty cool. I mean, you know, Whistle Mountain, one of my favorite Euro games, has a similar thing. You know, players create spaces on the board that other players want to go to. Unfortunately, I think I misinterpreted what he was saying because I got the impression this was going to be something a bit like Whistle Mountain, where you have these massive great great spaces on the board for you to go for worker placement and stuff. Though that aspect is pretty dialed down here. When he says players create worker placement spots for you to go to, we're literally just talking about three or four buildings that are on their board, most of which literally just say get a resource. That's it. That is all it is. And to do go there, you have to sacrifice VP that you give to the opponent to do so. So there's not even that much incentive to do it unless you're really desperate for the resource. So yeah, that dream was kind of dashed rather quickly. But that aside, was the game fun? We played four players and it does say 60 to 180 minutes on here. We did take a good two and a half hours, I think, to play this. Maybe even three, maybe not three hours, I mean, maybe two and a half to three, something like that. Bear in mind, we had to have a full teach. Two of us had not played it before. But yeah, the game feels really long for what it is. Essentially, what you are doing is that it is it is dry as a bone. You have a player board with these different spaces and all the, and the main board has a bunch of these spaces as well, where you're commissioning art and the like patronage basically and all the spaces have got these resource costs here with you know like marble and uh, <clears throat> we think metal we're not entirely sure if it's metal or not but you know metal gold which we kept calling lemons for the entire time because the icon for gold looks very much like a lemon so we basically just assumed that it was lemons which does inject more amusement and theme in the game than the game has trust me on that but the and wood and various other resources the basically is is that you've got your buildings that can generate these resources for you you have these little workers these little head dudes that you can place on the buildings to get the resources and it's a very tight resource management worker placement game where you get the resources uh, put the art pieces down on these spaces and these spaces will get you bonuses you know in in the income phase and obviously victory points the game production is fine. I mean, you've got wooden pieces for all the resources and, you know, like wooden tiles and that. But yeah, I mean, as you can see from the picture here, it is beige as all get out. You know, you've got some colored buildings that you put on your board and that and the resources are colored. And that's pretty much it. You look at the main board there, that is just one big collage of beige with a few pictures thrown on it. I mean, I have seen much, much worse. This game at least does try to inject a little bit of a uh, color into it, but it is still pretty beige. But you know, that's essentially all the game is. You're just basically getting the resources and then putting tiles on these various spaces, of which are some are more lucrative than others, and they just have different requirements for resources. Uh, there is a small card system where you can get a painter to help you with the art pieces, and you have to pay money to hire them, and they basically, depending on how much you're willing to pay, uh, they, they get you more victory points for doing it. Now, you might notice there's a die symbolism here we played with the no die variant um, because when I read the rules to the normal game and I read about how the dice system works I could not believe that a designer would put such a stupid mechanic in a three hour euro I mean maybe this would be one for the uh, top 10 later but yeah you basically roll randomly and it sort of dictates victory points and whether the artist stays or goes why would you put that in a three hour euro that makes no sense you know I, maybe it was a product of its time but I don't know, that's no excuse, because this would have come out in, you know, I mean, this was a 10th anniversary, so this thing must have come out in 2010. It's not like games were ancient in 2010, all right? You know, certain design decisions could have been avoided. But we played with the no-die variant, which means you start at a fixed level and spend money to increase it. Much better. You should always use that variant. I would never want to play this otherwise. But, you know, you essentially are just putting tiles out on these buildings, using the artists, and it's a tight resource management game. And that's kind of it. There's not really a lot that brings me back to want to play it more. I mean, there are a couple of things that do put me off slightly. The fact that you've got this reference chart that, you know, has the costs of everything in the game on it. It's two-sided and it basically is quite overwhelming when you look at this thing. But it is quite useful to have, so I can't knock it too much. But you remember how Colosseum gives you that giant player aid with a ton of stuff that you're supposed to forward plan for? 
well, you've got an element of that in this, and it's just like, ah, God, I hate it when you've got a forward plan, pretty much the whole, like, spectrum of what you want to build. But uh, it's not quite as bad as Colosseum, and certainly not maybe as bad as the Tricarion tricks that you have to do, where you have to kind of forward plan exactly what tricks you're going to use in Tricarion. So it's not too bad on that. But... The problem is, is that the game is just a bit too dry for my liking, and it kind of links into what I'm going to talk about later, but, you know, there's nothing new in this, and I get that this is a 2010 game, that's just an anniversary edition, so yes, it's going to be fairly old school, but all you do is collect the resources, put a few workers down to get resource, you know, I'll put it here and I'll get a lemon, put it here and I'll get a wood, uh, I generate a, a, a marble each round, I can go to this space and sell a wood for 200 money, fine, now I can go onto this space, this will give me a victory point income every turn on the purple banner, and, and more stuff happens, and you've got a church track, because every game set in Renaissance Italy has to have a church track, and honestly, the church track doesn't seem worth the cardboard it's printed on. You can go out of your way to bump along it, but it doesn't get you very many points, and the benefits are really minor. I mean, you're much better on your main board trying to fill out this bottom bit here, because if you can do that quick enough, you'll get victory point income every term, and given that the person who won only beat me because he had several of these victory point generating income things early in the game. Otherwise, we play pretty much the same. I mean, this game does not have pretty much any variety whatsoever. It is entirely one note. You know, there's not really a strategy you can formulate. It's just do what you got to do. But the church track, the you know, person who focused on the church track got very little reward out of it and came forth. I'm, I'm never going to look at this track. These these are basically a waste of space. In fact, the only reason I even built on one of these spaces is because you suffer negative victory points at the end of the game if you don't. So it's forcing you to do it. Again, games that force you to do this to avoid negative points, that always irks me a bit. You know, probably another design decision to think of the top 10. I really should start taking notes. But... Yeah, the game wasn't bad. I still enjoyed the time, although I think some of that was because we were calling things lemons and uh, the fact that we were obviously a game with mates. But the game itself is fine. It's average, maybe above average. I'd probably give it a five or a six. Um, I don't know. I think a six is probably... I'd probably say a five, a five out of ten. It's average. It's not a bad game, but there's just nothing really unique in it. There's nothing that's in that that engaging apart from the fact that it's quite tight uh, resource management but each round plays out pretty much exactly the same it's just except that it escalates a little bit in terms of how much you can get done but all you're doing is just you know working your way through higher spots on here to get a tile and shove it out there's nothing nothing kind of cool happens in between rounds uh these characters that you can go to at the top of the like card row where you can spend money to get a little bonus and you know they have they're so inefficient that nobody visits them at all it's just a waste this whole mechanic where you can be the captain of the people by being ahead in the point scoring order but then your points reset back to zero you cash them in effectively and then you go again isn't that interesting either i mean it's cool but everybody gets to be the captain of the person at some point because everybody resets to zero so at some point you're going to be the captain of the people it's just a case of when it happens so it doesn't really feel like much of an achievement it's just a it's an average euro it does the job but that's about as much as it does it, it it's not going to grip me to want to play it again if I play it again, I'll you know if it's the voted game I'll, and there's not much else available, I'll play it. But for a game that takes two and a half to three hours to play with a big group of players, it's a bit too one note and linear and just far too dry. You know there is no theme in this at all. I mean it could have been pasted with any setting and it would still work. So you know it just it doesn't have enough to want to draw me back. I mean it's that quote I used to use before that good mechanics will make me enjoy a game a good theme will pull me back for the second play this game has mechanics that work fine there's nothing particularly new or innovative about them but they work so I'll play the game and have a reasonable time but there is nothing to draw me back for a second play if I play it again it's because there wasn't any other better alternatives and so I would say it's an average game but nothing particularly to shout about ah. Nice bit of tea. So hopefully that hasn't uh, offended a ton of you beige euros out there. But I'm sorry, it's just, it's a generic euro. You know, that's kind of the problem we have. Okay, so why don't we talk about a quick bit of news first. Um, uh, let's see, I'm 
let's see. Uh, here we go. Uh, quick bit of news. Ticket to Ride. This is a game I love, so not going to lie, I'm certainly excited for this. But Ticket to Ride has kind of had a bit of a slump lately. But, you know, I didn't like Ticket to Ride Legacy. It felt like it was just cashing in on a fad. And the small Ticket to Rides are fine, but you literally only have to pick one, and that's it. I have London, that is the best of the lot so far, and that's the one I'm going to stick with. I don't care about having all five or six of them. There's just no need. What I want is more big map packs and some good ones. Well... They've answered my call because they've announced for later in the year, somewhere in the summer, I believe, uh, Iberia and South Korea as a map pack for the main game. This is what I want. I don't need little spin-offs anymore, and I don't need some weird big legacy, like, cash-in spin-off. What I want is just more maps for the main game. Now, this is going to make things interesting because I have got a crate of uh, Ticket to Ride in the other room. I bought a custom crate. And this was during my time when I realized, when I, before I realized that buying giant wooden crates for games is a complete waste of money. Um, I was a bit of a sucker for them and I wish I could get the money, well, I got the money back on some of them. I mean, I, not necessarily the games themselves, but certainly the crates. Uh, you'll notice in the background the legendary crate and the Eldritch Horror and Arkham Horror crate are gone. They are entirely gone. They have been sold. I have retained Adian Legendary. I put it back in its original box with the dividers and stuff. So I should still be able to play that. But Predator Legendary is gone. Uh, the Firefly Legendary is gone. Uh, Arkham Horror 2nd Edition is all gone. Eldritch Horror is all gone. All of it's gone because it just wasn't getting played. And frankly, as I said, Mansions of Madness and Arkham Horror LCG does it better. Even the 3rd edition of Arkham Horror, I'm not sure I'm going to hang on to for too much longer at this rate. But, you know, they digress. But I have a giant wooden crate of Ticket to Ride, and it holds all the Ticket to Ride stuff in it, but it also weighs a metric ton. When am I going to take that to a game night? It's just not going to happen. So it stores it all neatly at home, but again, I can't just easily take bits out of it and play it. And I don't play Ticket to Ride at my own house. I play it at other people's, and usually they have a copy of a normal Ticket to Ride there. So I kind of made the mistake of buying the wretched thing. At some point, I need to dismantle it and put things in some boxes. The only problem is... I don't have a lot of Ticket to Ride boxes, so I'm a little bit questionable as to how I'm going to be able to store this. Um, so, yeah. Ouch. Whoops. So I'm going to have to kind of figure that out at some point. But it may be that this one has to be a separate box, but then I've got a separate box to a big crate. Uh, why did I buy the stupid crate? Top tip for me. If you see a giant big wooden custom crate for your game, unless it is something that is going to take you a day to play, like something like the uh, the Firefly crate. I've seen that in action. And it's like, that's a massive metric ton thing. But when you play Firefly, you're playing it for half a day because it takes way too long. But at least that makes the crate worth it. And that is a pretty decent looking crate. But... Big giant wooden crates for games like this where you're only going to play it every now and again. Unless you're going to play it a ton at home, they're not worth the money. Anyway, I digress. I'm supposed to be talking about this expansion. Well, there's only so much information on it. I mean, Iberia, we've all, you know, Iberia, so a bit of Spain and uh, South Korea. South Korea is going to be interesting because I don't know much about the landscape of Korea. So that will be a cool map to try. But essentially, there's not a lot of information. It mentions here on this page. So uh, what have we got to... You will go to the festive squares of Seville, collect and maximize sets of festival cards as your network expands, but plan your travel carefully as other players will offer a fierce competition to reach cities and claim the rewards before you do. Sounds like a set collection game. Okay, sounds nothing major there. It also includes a South Korea map, which offers a unique twist in how routes are organized. Be quick and efficient using your high-speed train bonuses to claim the most valuable routes and secure the highest positions on the province chart. That's interesting, and... It doesn't mention it here, but in some of the Facebook media, it's mentioned the words drafting tickets. That does fill me with a little bit of um, intrigue because, you know, the formula of Ticket to Ride has been set in stone for ages. But when games like the UK version throw a bit of a spanner in the works as to how it work, uh, how the game plays, I really like it. This one, introducing the idea of drafting tickets could be really cool. and I want to see that in action. So I'm looking forward to that in play. But, you know, this also is a quite an interesting word from the author, so Alan R. Moon. Uh, for many years, Switzerland has been my favorite Ticket to Ride map. Wow, that's usually low down on the scale for most people. And, I mean, Switzerland's a fine map, but tunnels are a bad mechanic in Ticket to Ride. So, yeah, I'm not going to agree with you on that one. But, I mean, come on, United Kingdom's the best one. You've got to say it. 
Uh, but without adding any real complexity to the rules, uh, Iberia or South Korea changes the game completely. Makes the choice between claiming routes and drawing cards tense on almost every turn of the game. The Korea map is my second attempt at grouping routes by color, and it also changes the game without, lot, uh, without adding complexity. Okay, cool. The Express Train cards do add a little complexity, but allow players to follow different strategies. Uh, expansion Pack 8 is now my favorite so far. I mean, to be honest, you're the designer of the game, so isn't that kind of inherent that you've got to say that the next one is your favorite? But, uh, like I say, you are the designer, and you have said that Switzerland is your favorite, so I, I, don't, I guess you're being honest on that one. But, yeah, you know, some high praise there. But that's about as much as I know. There's not much else I can see, and the picture doesn't really go into a lot of, you know, I can't really show much on that picture there, but I'm, I'm intrigued. I, you know, I want to grab this i want to review it i want to do a beyond the base game video for it and i like tick i love ticket to ride so it'll be good to play this with the parents if i see them at the time but if not i'm certain i'll get it played if i take it to board game clubs so i guess that's the you know the way it shall go but yeah looking forward to it more mint tea mm. keep the throat going keep the throat going Right, let's talk about uh, the topic of the day. So again, you know, it's been suggested to me by uh, commenters on this one. I talk heavily about theme in games, and I've just talked about Forenza, which is like the antithesis of theme. But, you know, and actually only just this morning, um, uh, you know, someone I know on Facebook was doing a solo review of Maracaibo. Well, solo review, he was basically saying how much he loves the solo mode of Maracaibo. And, you know, he tagged me in the post uh, as a, when I was, because he remembered that when I talked about Maracaibo, I said that the camp, the solo campaign was a letdown because it was a pasted theme that didn't make any sense. But, and I still stand by that. You know, the game itself, Maracaibo, is fine. I used to own it, but I did sell it because really the bit that was drawing me in was the card system, which is easily the best part of it. But it has no theme. It is just basically a race around the rondel. Um, you know, there's mechanics like the exploration being just a track you move up. And the game is variable in uh, the, the fleet mechanic with the English fleet, the French fleet, and whatever the other one was, you know, is really, really clunky and didn't really work that well. And on top of that, the game is variable length, which means the game could end before you realize it because somebody rushes around the rondelle too fast it it's got problems and so i did sell it eventually but you know he was talking a lot about how you know he was he loved the fact that it was a rich story driven campaign and you know with legacy aspects and it's like yes it's got legacy aspects but for crying out loud it's maracaibo there is no theme in that story the story doesn't even make sense if you read the rule book carefully it mentions that there's a duration of time that each lap of the board represents and it's something like I can't remember, a year, five years, ten years. It's certainly a number of years, okay? You could go on one lap and get a story aspect that says, you're going to go meet this woman on this island. You know, okay, cool. Well, I've just passed that island. Okay, I'll get it on the next lap round. That means you don't technically visit this person for another five to ten years. How does that make any sense? You know, it literally is... It's such a weird plot hole that you could literally just see the meme from the... Ah, oh, what is that meme called? Oh, what's that Disney movie? Oh, that's going to drive me nuts now. I can't remember what it is. Uh, the the one with the Gronk. The one with Gronk, where the, the meme where he goes, you know, they, they get, the enemy gets to the bit before the good guys, and they ask, how on earth did you beat us? And he goes, well, you got me, you know, he pulls down the charges for all the cows it doesn't make any sense like the film pokes fun at its own plot holes love it uh, oh emperor's new groove that's it ah oh, now i remembered but i think it's emperor's new groove whatever the one where the guy turns into a camel for half of it or something but it's a it's a good funny movie and i love the gronk character along with the uh you know the other lady the, the other sort of uh, um, antagonist but that meme I love. I love to use it in my videos, and it's just such a cool one. But that's basically summarizes the plot holes in Maracaibo. But I digress a little bit here. What I'm getting at is that people sort of go like, "All oh, right, you like theme in games and all that." And so the question is, when is theme essential in a game for me? And I'm not saying this has got to apply for everybody. There are people out there who will play the driest, you know, driest lump of sand for five hours, you know, and they'll be fine. You know, they'll play an 18xx game for six hours and they won't mind, you know, how dry as a bone it is, okay? You know, that's fine. <laughs> you want to play a dry game for four hours and you enjoy it, then do so. But for me, 
when is the theme essential in a game? Because it's not that every single game on my shelf is richly thematic. I mean, you know, some games certainly do have a good thematic flair. I mean, Pursuit of Happiness for a Euro is pretty thematic. The Vital Asserters I own behind my head are pretty well thematic. Um, but then, you know, you could argue that Earth you know, is mostly an engine builder tableau game. The theme is only there in so many ways in that one. Uh, obviously, something like Marvel Champions is uh, pretty thematic with the superhero stuff and Mansions of Madness, but then below that is Twilight Inscription, the roll and write TI game. Yeah, are you really going to tell me that that is thematic? <laughs> you know, it's not the most thematic game in the world either. So it's not that every single game on my shelf is a thematic masterpiece, but... There are some games I can forgive it more than others, and even then, some of my favorite games are going to be thematic, whereas some of my games that, you know, struggle a little bit more to get played more often are going to be the dry ones. A good example would be Newton. Uh, let's see if I can uh, bring that up on the screen here, because I have... Right, here we go. Let's go back to the Forenza video a second. Whoop. So, Newton. This is a game from, I think, Cranio Creations. It's, uh, you know... It's a light game. It's from Simone Luciani, um, and to be on, to be honest, it's probably one of the few Luciani games I actually enjoy because I'm not a big fan of this designer's games. But it's a it's a fun game, and it's got some cool mechanics in it. But my guys, it dries a bone. <laughs> like this thing is just super, super dry. It is just moving along tracks and getting tiles and doing weird little bonus things. But it's got a cool, fun system in it. But it is dry as a bone. And so as much as it is on my shelf and I do enjoy it, I haven't got this out in ages. And there's a couple of reasons for it. Firstly, the lack of a theme struggles to draw me back in because I'd rather play something that I can immerse myself into and escape from reality in some way. But also, the rules to the game will be something I'll forget over time for not playing it. And if you don't play a dry game for that long, it's very tough to get back into the rule set because the theme, the strong theme of a game can help you learn the game. I mean, as much, we'll talk about it in more detail in a minute, but, you know, Hegemony, for example, is really rich and thematic. But, you know, the fact that it is a really heavy game is offset by the fact that the theme is so strong that a lot of the rules make sense. And some of the Vital Asserters are the same stuff. I mean, Kanban is, you know, chock full of rules, but it's very easy to teach Kanban because the, the rules make sense. You understand the thematic applications of making a car, designing one, and dodging your boss at work. So those mechanics make sense, and so they stick in your mind. The mechanics in Newton do not stick in your mind. I mean, if you forget, if you don't play this game for a good six months to a year or something, you're going to forget every mechanic that's in it. You'd have to read through the entire rule book and go, so how does that bit work? Oh, yeah, it flips over if you do this aspect, and then on the end of the turn, they shuffle along, and then uh, if you cover these in a row or column, you get more bonuses. I think that's something down there. It's, like, you know, it's not easy to relearn the game when you take out the theme. But, you know, when is it essential? Because... I'm going to say when it's essential and at times when it's not, you know, sort of throughout. But let's talk about story-driven games. So, you know, my friend on Facebook was talking about Maracaibo and how he, you know, likes the solo campaign. He didn't, I think he, whether he used the word thematic, I don't know, but he did He did call it rich. And I think he actually did mention the words theme. Like, you know, he, he, he liked the good thematic solo campaign. I'm sorry, but the solo campaign of Maracaibo is just not thematic, but ah, digress. Here's a, here's a thematic solo game, though, or a story-driven game, Tainted Grail. You know, I'm still playing through Kings of Ruin at the moment, although I haven't played it in a while. I need to hurry up and get back to that because it is sucking up my table space. But, you know, you can't beat games like Tainted Grail for solid theme in a game. I mean, the rich lore of this gritty Arthurian legend universe, uh, you know, with the, 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 the storybook, the exploration journal, and the artwork, and all the stuff you do. I mean, you don't even have to listen to music when you play this, but if you do, it just adds to the atmosphere. It is such a great, rich, thematic game. And now, this is a game that you're going to play for multiple hours, multiple campaigns, and it's going to be something you're going to need to get immersed in. Well, something like this then needs to be rich and thematic, because if this was a dry tale that didn't really make any sense, you know, then what would I care? Legacy games have done this occasionally. Like, you get a um, as much as I like the Pandemic Legacy games, particularly with Season Zero, you find that the story just isn't that interesting and not immersive at all. And so you don't get immersed in that area. And so you're basically just playing a mechanical game that uh, changes itself each game. And, you know, when you've seen Legacy games, the Legacy format thrown onto such 
dryness. You know, I know Cosmos, I think, did a couple, like My City and stuff. You know, then why are we caring about the fact that we're replaying this all the time just because a little bit in the game changes? What you want is all that story and richness, and that is what Tainted Grail, for example, does in spades. It just gives you that world for you to have, you know, all the time. I mean, you don't have to read these extra lore bits where it talks about the monsters that come out, but you're tempted to just because of how cool they are when you play the actual game. You know, you don't need the miniatures. You know, the miniatures are fantastic, but I've said that this has got some of the best writing in a, in a campaign game to date. It is such good writing. You know, I love reading every single word when I play the solo. You know, the descriptions, the locations, the interactions you have with player NPCs, and it's just Mm, it's such a glorious like thematic experience so if this was dry i would hate it probably i just i don't think i would get into this at all and so certainly from a you know you got to have the theme strong in a story driven game because the whole point of a theme is that it immerses you more in the game so a story should be immersive you know you can't just have a a dry storybook is basically a textbook <laughs> that's what it is the rule books are textbooks effectively they are the dry story bit that you're reading um you know if i read a tax manual to do my like job at work that's not an immersive experience i'm reading and learning stuff it's a dry textbook you know so you know th there is a difference between the two so let's talk about um like another he like heavy game as i mentioned hegemony so yeah, we had a fun game of it yesterday. I didn't like the fact that I had to teach the game to somebody who uh, didn't quite tell the truth about whether he'd played the game before when I asked for experienced players. I was a bit miffed about that, but I taught it anyway, and we still had fun. And at least it did make that we could have a four-player game rather than a three-player game. But Hegemony, um, we, had, we had a weird one with the, the game, actually, sort of as a side point. We had a position where the state basically had no workers on it. It had companies open but no workers because some of them got privatized and the workers kind of went elsewhere to work for the capitalist. Um, so the public sector just wasn't producing anything. It was kind of weird how it was just like basically scorched earth on his side of the board. It was kind of amusing. But, you know, it still was state was still getting enough points from just generally doing his legitimacy tracks. But it was quite amusing that he couldn't get any resources for the middle class uh, myself and the working class to buy, so we were having fun with the capitalists. But then the capitalists was new to the game, so it's not like that they were suddenly dominating the game as a result. But, I digress. This is, like, one of my favourite games of all time. It is heavy, you have got asymmetric factions that play differently, but the theme in this is so strong on how it takes into account social class politics, working class, middle class, capitalist and the state, how they interact, what their agendas are, how they, you know, how their companies work, what their needs are. It's just so rich in theme. And some of that is brought out by, you know, the interaction with the players as well, because this is a heavy game that you interact with players. Therefore, the fact that it takes a long time is offset by two things. The fact that you are interacting with players and the fact that the theme is rich and immersive. You get into this setting, you get into this world, you 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 almost role-playing the factions that you are. I mean, the capitalist scum, the working-class peasants, the middle-class avocado eaters, you know, this uh, the corrupt government. You know, there's definitely some banter that goes back and forth with this. But I get a kick out of this game every time I play it. And even the way the voting system works, you know, and, you know, how you know, how taxation affects, like, labor, how the taxation works in general, like, the fact that corporate tax is based on the revenue of the capitalist, uh, not its capital amount, so, you know, they fought hard about how these things work, and just how the, the feeling of the gameplay changes with these policies, like, we had a game at Handycom, where we had low wages, fairly high tax, but we managed to get into a situation where four and five were on A's, so healthcare and education for a long time was free. I think I was playing the working class at that time. It was, was I playing the working class? I feel like I was. Yes, I was. I was playing working class because the wages were low, but I didn't care because everything was free. It was kind of funny. And, you know, the setting kind of like you could compare it to like, so this is basically the NHS on crack, is it? You know, so we're, you know, the NHS, if the NHS actually worked, you know, and was funded properly. Well, we could digress a million years about that, but... 
you know, with this one, it just kind of made for a really fun setting. And you remember it. You know, we were chatting for an hour after the game finished about what happened in the game and how this, like, changes from other games. And only a thematic game can help you do that. I'm not talking about what I did in Forenza for an hour afterwards. I mean, it's like, you know, I did some... I did some tile placement and I did some resource gathering and there you go it's like what am I supposed to talk about same with Newton and a few of these others you know it's not going to generate a story but this does this generates a story pursuit of happiness generates a story when you're playing it and you know that is all done from interaction as well as a strong theme the other thing is, is that this game takes a good four hours to play a typical game of this if this game was dry as a bone, I'd be bored out of my brain within like an hour, an hour and a half, because I'd be like, oh my god, we got to sit in this for another three hours. Oh god, this is going to take forever. Time flies when I'm playing this game, though, because I'm immersed greatly. But you couldn't sell this to me and make it a dry experience and expect me to play it for four hours. It just wouldn't work. And so there's the point I'm trying to make. If it's a very long game, I think theme is essential. There are people who love Twilight Imperium 4 and, you know, the Twilight Imperium series. And fine, I don't mind Twilight Imperium, but to be honest... It doesn't matter how thematic you make a game, there is no way you are going to convince me that any game is worth playing for a good six to eight hours. That is just ridiculous. I mean, we, I taught Hegemony to a player from scratch. I set it up. We started a good hour and a half, two hours after a Twilight Imperium six-player game took place, had started, and we still finished ages before the TI4 game ended. In fact, we finished, I packed it away, I hung around for a bit, and I eventually left, and they were still playing, you know, and our game took a good four plus hours because I had to teach it and it was a slower game, but man, there are limits to how much the theme carries, and honestly, is the theme that strong in Twilight Imperium? I mean, that's probably heresy to some people, I mean, it's certainly got, you know, cool look, and it's got the alien races, and you certainly do feel like you're engaged in space battles and stuff, so yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give it credit, it's definitely got some theme there, but any exploration that's in this game is literally bare bones at best, you know, the game plays out pretty much the same every time, I mean, everybody sort of congregates in the middle into a massive cluster battle, and then somebody comes out on top, but then you've also got the Euro game mechanics in it, which kind of feel very Euro-y as opposed to the Amerifrashi style that you kind of want for a space battle game, but I mean, I don't mind the game. Twilight Imperium is fine, but I mean, look at this. I mean, this is just unwieldy as anything. Now, can you tell what is going on in this picture with all these ships congregated and all these tiny hexes and that? It's just, oh, it's just an absolute messy cluster. That's what gets me with this. But, you know, it has its fun moments, but it's just too much. You know, six to eight hours. The theme cannot be strong enough to keep me going for that long. But again, I digress. So where do we have big heavy Euros that take too long that aren't thematic enough? Well, um, you know, as much as some people might cry heresy, Voidfall is a good example because Voidfall is, you know, popular amongst a bunch of gamers, fair play. But let's be perfectly honest with ourselves, people here. Is Voidfall really a thematic game? Yes, it may have nice looks, you know, with the orange pieces everywhere. And yes, you can play a different faction, but is it really thematic? I mean, the setting is essentially a made-up setting, and when all said and done, the mechanics of the card system and how the corruption works, and you know how you know how you go around the map and stuff is like a lot of it doesn't feel like a big thematic space game, does it? It feels like you're basically playing a big, heavy mechanical Euro with a space theme pasted on it, and that's the thing that slightly puts me off it, you know, the fact that when I play it, I don't get immersed in this world of space battles and, you know, you know, you know, space alien civilizations and stuff like that. I feel like I'm just playing a bunch of mechanics, which is plentiful to say the least, and trying to deal with the fact that this game is going to take me four plus hours, and it's literally, you get about, you know, a few things to do every now and again, and you're kind of waiting endlessly for everyone else to take their turns. Oh god, I don't like this game multiplayer, but solo it was better, but still it was just a lot of stuff to do. And again, the rules because the rules of this because this game is not particularly that thematic, 
learning the rules of this game was an absolute chore. You know, if I put this game down for more than half an hour, I would forget half the game. I had to rules reference a ton while playing this game because the rules just don't stick in my mind because there's A, so many of them, and B, the theme isn't strong enough to gel it all together and make it flow. Hegemony has a lot of rules, but they interact with other people. Some of them are repeated among classes. You know, some classes can do the same action as another, but because you understand how the actions of one class affect the actions of another class, the rules gel and stick. This one doesn't have that. It, you know, I could, I can play this entire game and forego a good chunk of the rule book because I don't like playing warlike in these games. So. I tend to be the one that sits back and creates a really good economic civilization. And every time I play Voidful, I do that. I pick a faction that isn't particularly war heavy, sit at the back, turtle up, get get victory points that way, win the game, and I barely had to attack anything apart from a couple of NPC things. You know, it kind of defeats the whole purpose of a big space battle game, you know, when I can literally ignore half the rule book and still win. <laughs> it's kind of odd. But, you know, that's... You know, you could argue maybe this has a little theme, but are you going to argue something like Inventions has a theme? Um, no. I love Vital Lacerda games, okay, to, an, to a point. I hate Escape Plan and CO2. All right, I like most of them. Uh, and Weather Machine was kind of above average. All right, I like most of them, okay? But, you know, Gallerist, Lisboa, Kanban, Vinyos. Now, Lisboa, theme-wise, is a little bit off. It's historically accurate but what you're doing in the game is a little bit on the weird side from a thematic standpoint but again it's also the hardest one for me to learn because of that out of the four but Vinyos, Galaris particularly, Kanban especially they have got such good themes that the mechanics just work. They make sense. You know, you're promoting the artists, and as you buy the art, and you know, you commission the art, and as they get better, you know, as they buy and sell art, they get more popular, and so you know, their art is worth more. And people come to your gallery to look at the art, and collectors will walk off with it after you sell it. It's a lot of the stuff is thematic and Kanban, dodging your boss and building the cars, assembling them and testing the parts out, studying to get ahead of your boss. It's like all that stuff's thematic. And the vineyards, vin you know, running the vineyard, wines, submitting them to the fair, having them be judged. You know, a lot of that stuff is, again, thematically rich. Inventions ain't got a theme. I mean, hell, Weather Machine was questionable about whether it had a theme. I, I get people have argued this to the, the cows come home about the, uh, you know, the theme in Weather Machine, but it's a very niche theme when you think about it. Come on, at least give me that. But Inventions? What theme is there in this? This is pure mechanics for the sake of mechanics. You know, the worker placement system is just a, well, work, the action selection system is essentially a mechanical thing. The fact that these technologies level into each other is about as bare bones a theme as you can get and even though it's not like it's not like oh i know how i know how to iron smelt therefore i can now make cool things out of iron no it's just the fact that the card links into this card it doesn't make you feel like you really invented iron smelting it's just oh i leveled up to this card you've got this bit around the map which doesn't make a huge amount of sense thematically but then it gets worse when you look at your player board i wonder if there's a more zoomed in version of a player board somewhere uh come on Come on, don't be shy. Show off your player board. Come on, show it. Here we go, this thing. So, you know, where you get these tiles and these tiles you put on this grid in front of you and literally it's only put on that grid to put them in weird clusters or in certain sequences to score points for abstract reasons. I mean, this one here I think is literally saying you get three points if you can put like a tile next to a cluster of three or something. I don't even know what that exactly means. Again, the iconography is not 100% clear, but, you know, there is a lot of iconography in this game. It is not intuitive, but wow. I mean, this, this whole grid system is completely abstract. I've forgotten how it works for the most part already because it's just so, like, non thematic it's unreal but inventions is not a short game you're playing this for a good three hours plus like any vital lacerda game and because it's bone dry i don't get i don't feel like i want to play it again i played it a few times uh but sorry a couple of times and i just thought meh not worth it you know and, and bear in mind this was that pre-kickstarter stage so somebody else had a copy and i've played it a couple of times but each time i just felt meh it does the job but i'd much rather play one of these behind my head than this one. You know, this one I've already forgotten about for the most part, but it's going to have some fans, you know, some fans of Lacerda who will literally eat everything that Lacerda releases. But when thinking about it, nah, this one has a few problems, and theme is certainly one of them. 
So, okay. So, certainly from a long game perspective, theme is important. So, do I need theme in every game for me to like it? No, there are some drier games that work. I mean, you know, Ark Nova has a theme, although you could, un you could argue that maybe the theme is not super super strong in it but the mechanics are so good in it that you know i can overlook a little bit of that theme aspect because it is so much fun to do those mechanics you know they there's a decent amount of them but they feel smoother and a bit more not necessarily streamlined but they're not clunky compared to a lot of other mechanics but you know when is theme not essential i think game length is probably the big aspect here because i've just talked about some very long very heavy games right so why don't we have a look at some stuff that's light and fluffy, yet still really dry? I mean, a game I played uh, yesterday, in fact, and I've reviewed it, Veil of Eternity. Okay, this is a pretty cool, very light engine builder game. You know, very simple, very few rules. The theme in this is completely non-existent. I mean, the title is literally just going to chase people away because people are going to say, what on earth is the Veil of Eternity? I don't know. But... There's no theme in this. It's literally an engine builder card game where you draft a couple of creatures each round, play them, and score victory points in various ways. There's no theme here. It is bone dry. But this is a 45-minute game. It's a very quick experience. I mean, an hour tops, but we're hopefully 45 minutes if people get on with it. And it's just... It's done and dusted really quick. I don't need a theme to keep me super immersed if the mechanics are genuinely pretty cool... And the game is short enough to compensate for the fact that you don't immerse yourself in the theme. I like puzzles as much as the next person. And three hour Lacerda games can be a giant puzzle. But for example, I like Sudoku puzzles. Okay, I don't do them that often. But if I go home and I'm at the parents, they might do a crossword. I might do a Sudoku puzzle from their Times paper, right? I like doing a Sudoku puzzle. I can't do expert level ones. They just confuse the hell out of me. But... I want to do a Sudoku puzzle in the space of 30 to 45 minutes, okay, like, you know, an hour absolute tops. I don't want to be spending half the day doing the same Sudoku puzzle. Crosswords are a similar thing. It's good to do a crossword up to a point, but once you get stuck and you really can't figure out some of those other answers, I'm kind of done. You know, I don't want to spend the whole day trying to decipher whether this one word could be this or this. It's like, look, we got to a point, this is as much as we could figure out, can we move on to the next one? And I'm same with Sudoku. Eventually, I'll reach a point where it's like, oh, I can't be bothered to figure out the rest of this. It's like, this is taking forever. Can we do something else? And maybe that's a, you know, it's not an attention span problem. I mean, I like playing. I've just mentioned a bunch of heavy, long games I love playing. It's not that I can't focus for four hours. It's just the fact that if the game is going to be worth my time, and time is very precious at the moment, I mean, we're almost at the end of the weekend, and I don't necessarily feel like I've achieved very much in the day and a half of the weekend. And there's so much to do time is just precious and I don't want to spend four hours doing something that I feel could be done quicker or isn't going to justify the four hour game length but something like Veil of Eternity 45 minutes bone dry doesn't matter it's quick and it's done I like trick-taking games so I already mentioned things like uh, Nikosu uh, Dice there's no theme in Nikosu Dice it's literally you know a trick-taking game with cards and dice it's a quick little card game it well quick about an hour but it's not meant to be thematic it's not meant to be like immersive or anything like that it's just a cool set of s mechanical systems that work really well get you thinking get you interacting with other players which i guess actually that's probably another thing that helps in dry games if you're interacting with other players that does help you know for example i mean you could play newton you don't really interact with players much it's pretty multiplayer solitaire and you know, a lot of these other dry euros could just be multiplayer solitaire, in which case, why on earth am I playing this game for four hours when I could play something that's an hour long and more interactive? Um, you know, people, well, funny enough, on the screen here, here we go, yeah, Castles of Burgundy, the special edition. I hate the Castles of Burgundy game. I don't know why everybody loves it so much, but you know, to each their own. But, you know, and why it came out in the special edition, I've no idea. But, you know, this is a bone-dry game, and it's not the shortest game in the world. I mean, it's not terribly long, but you are still talking a good two hours to play this game at times. I don't want to play a super dry game for two hours that's literally just dice and tiles, and that's about it. You know, I mean, I still don't get the appeal for this game in general. You know, I, I digress. Uh, I Maybe this is one I should add to the list for the um, games that I've 
didn't like in the past that I should try again now. I did it with Great Western Trail, and look how that turned out. And, you know, but then there are ones that I tried again, like, you know, you know, Hansa do Tonica and, you know, Eclipse and stuff like that. And those games are still garbage for me. I don't like any of them, you know, even after this time. What's the other one? Brussels 1893 or something. Garbage when I played it. Still garbage now. But maybe I would enjoy this a bit more now. But I reckon that some of that would just come down for the fact of how good this new version looks. But no way this game justifies the price point and space this one takes up. It's just too over the top. But... You know, it's dry as a bone and it's two hours and it just doesn't have that pull to bring me back in because the mechanics are going to have to be so solid to make me focus for that long. And in this one, for me, they're just not. Uh, what other short game would work? Let's see. Short games aren't terribly thematic. Uh, um, oh, I'm trying to think. I mean, Seven Wonders and stuff. I mean, Seven Wonders is probably a good idea. I mean, Seven Wonders, the drafting game, yeah, it's, you don't really feel like you're building up a civilization in Seven Wonders. I mean, you're drafting cards and different colors relate to different things like commerce and culture and stuff, but you're drafting cards and playing them to score victory points and chain combos. I mean, it's not like I feel that I'm building up a rich, thematic civilization when I'm playing this game, but the game's done in 45 minutes. It's a quick drafting game. What you know, I don't need it to immerse me in a rich world for that time length. And honestly, most short games don't have strong themes. I'm trying to look at my shelf and trying to think, is there a short game that I have that I could consider truly thematic? And honestly, I'd kind of like your comments in the uh, YouTube comments for this. A short game, and we're talking 45 minutes or less, that is richly thematic and immersive. I would like to kind of know that because I am struggling as hell to see anything on my shelf, I could consider that. I mean, Coffee Roaster? Uh, Coffee Roaster does a pretty good job of representing its theme pretty well. That is a quick game. So, I mean, that's my first um, inkling. But I'm looking at all sorts of... I mean, Wingspan? Wingspan's not the longest game in the world, although it can go to 90 minutes with a lot of players. And you are men's... I mean, the theme setting is lovely. Way better than Wormspan. But the... It's still an engine builder card game at the end of the day, even though there are some thematic applications. But, you know, that is another potential contender, I guess. But, I mean, Small Islands, Reef, uh, Ra, you know, uh, Majesty for the Realm, Isle of Sky. Uh, what else have we got? King of Tokyo, Get on Board, Biblio, Celestia, Splendor, Spellbook. You know, are any of these games ringing bells in terms of rich themes? I'm not entirely convinced on that front. Uh, but the last thing I want to mention is another time when I think the theme is essential. Because I've talked a lot about game length. And, you know, and certainly I think that is the key time when theme is essential. But here's another time when it's essential. IP. IP. If you're going to put a theme on a game that is representative of an IP, you had better make it thematically rich to it. Because otherwise you are doing a disservice to it. So you will already remember that I, you know, gave a pretty damn good rating to Deep Rock Galactic. Deep Rock Galactic, a game that I still play on the PC every now and again, can still wipe the floor with most settings, but uh, I don't mod my game, but yeah, Hazard 5, haha, <laughs> I can deal with it fine. Not necessarily solo, it's pretty tricky to do some of them solo, but as a group, easy. But Deep Rock Galactic, the board game, so respects the IP that it's based on, not just by its look and its miniatures and stuff like that, but the gameplay and what you do is so rich and tied to what, you know, Deep Rock Galactic is if you have played the game. Now, if they literally just pasted the theme on and didn't care, I'd be a bit miffed about that. You know, you'd be doing a disservice to the game, which is so rich in theme that you can't, do an IP on it and just make it a dry euro. So something like this works. And I think with an IP, it's essential that you make a good thematic game because you've paid extra money for the IP. You're drawing in fans who love the IP. If you then don't respect the IP and don't make a thematic game based on it, then what was the point? You're just annoying people who come to play the game and you're just wasting money at that point. But you know, another good example, uh, pretty rich in theme on how it plays, is XCOM. XCOM, the board game. Uh, I, you know, the app and how that works and how you're, you know, 
trying to fend off aliens from your base while doing missions and you know dealing with the ufos that are flying down the tension the atmosphere the sound effects from the app you know the roles that you play you know that they are again doing a good service doing doing a good service to the original ip and so if this was just a bone dry game that didn't give you the same tension as a normal XCOM game i'd be kind of bored and just would never want to play it and it's still on my shelf now it you know definitely works in that respect so okay well why don't we take a really really rich ip you know a rich ip that has been in so many games like well you might be thinking lord of the rings i'm thinking star wars outer rim anyone um you know and you could even argue star wars rebellion imperial assault those sort of games but you know outer rim this is a game of bounty hunters, mercenaries, and such, as it says. It is what it says on the tin, and what are these? Ugh, these are some horrible-looking miniatures. They're not in the game. Don't worry about that. This one has a rich theme. It does service to its IP. You are going around doing bounties, upgrading your ship, trying to outrun the other bounty hunters, deal with the Imperial and the Rebels. You can have your signature ships from the show. I mean, this is a rich, formatic game, and yeah, it does take a while. This is another long game, even if you're playing it solo, but... Man, is it good fun to play, and man, is it going to immerse you in that theme. It does a really solid job, and so back to the length thing I mentioned, but also respecting its IP, this sort of thing works. Now, are there games that do not use the IP well, and yet can you know, take it? Well, I mean, I've heard slightly disturbing things about the new cyberpunk game uh, gangs of night city i mean i'm playing cyberpunk at the moment on the pc and wow it is making my um intel 12 900k processor basically heat up the room it is uh, generating a very hot processor i mean it scares me how hot it gets but apparently it's meant to do that apparently it doesn't do any harm that's what all the tech support people are telling me so uh, you know i will basically trust to it and the game still runs smooth as butter on my system so fine but man the theme of cyberpunk that world in the game is so nice to walk around in and just endure but when i've watched reviews of gangs of night city it doesn't really feel like cyberpunk um you know you know all the stuff about this area control with the different factions and stuff like that it's like that's not what i got from cyberpunk you know where's all the cool like i mean yeah you've used characters in the games or i mean i recognize johnny silverhand and i gotta admit it's so great having keanu reeves uh like in that game it's just it's so great the voice acting but you know then you got you know characters i recognize like uh, you know judy alvarez who i'm trying to get my um female character to uh um mate with at some point uh, <laughs> the cyberpunk game does give you opportunities where you actually can basically have sex with uh various other characters depending on how the plots go and i've turned down several of them because i actually really like judy <laughs> she's really cute and i love a tech whiz in games so i'm just kind of like trying my best and it hasn't happened yet so i'm trying so much to deal with that it's insane but yeah that's a fit that's a thematic story that's being told but this one from the reviews does not feel like cyberpunk I mean, I look at this game and I'm not even thinking cyberpunk. This whole picture. There is nothing in this game apart from the occasional exclamation mark triangle and a couple of names that tells me that this is a cyberpunk game. When I showed you the pictures of XCOM and Star Wars Outer Rim and that, you could tell instantly what the IP was. But if you showed me this without any other context, I wouldn't know this was cyberpunk. And that, you know, that doesn't work. I mean, I don't want to play this. I don't feel like this will be a fun game because you're going to draw me into this game thinking, oh yeah, this will be be like cyberpunk, and yet it just isn't. And I know there's going to be, you know, other examples of when this is done. I mean, uh, well, I mean, Lord of the Rings has done it for ages. So when we just type in Lord of the Rings, I'm sure we'll get a million games on the uh, search front here. So Lord of the Rings, the card game, very thematic. That makes sense. Lord of the Rings Journeys of Middle Earth, again, a thematic story driven campaign makes sense okay the lord of the rings um as in the uh 2000 reiner knizia game <laughs> where you literally move along the track and you put tiles down i think i can't remember exactly how it works it's been a long time but that's kind of all you're doing you're basically just putting tiles down and marking a route and that's it this game does not have theme okay ah! 
Ah, uh, sorry about that. That was a big spider on the screen. I got, I got up a picture of Shelob, um, and I hate spiders. I wasn't expecting it, and so it just like fired me out in fright. On YouTube, that'll make sense, but on podcast, that's gonna sound really weird. Oh well, hopefully that gave you a bit of a laugh and didn't freak you out too much as much as me. But yeah, I mean this. Oh, there it is in the background again. Well, it's in the background. I can kind of deal with it. But yeah, you're just putting tiles on the board and moving along and that's it. I mean, it's just, that's it. The theme in this game is non-existent. So why on earth would I want to, you know, go through it? I'm going to be careful, like, going back through this. Yep. <laughs> oh, I'm such a wuss. But, you know, all these other ones. Lord of the Rings, The Confrontation. Fanatic? Mm, question mark? Risk, the Lord of the Rings Trilogy Edition. Okay, what? You know, this is going a little bit too far. Um, the the dice game, uh, I mean, a lot of these are Lord of the Rings, the card games, but I mean, there's a bunch of these Lord of the Rings games I've never even heard of. This is how much it's been sort of just ripped apart. Monopoly, the Lord of the Rings Edition. Wow, you know, strong theme on that one. You know, So there's a lot of times that the IP is just literally pasted onto a game to sell more copies and lord of the rings i think is one of the worst contenders for how it literally has been just butchered by people and not represented well you know i mean let's face it we've already got that problem in the um uh, tv industry with the rings of power seriously if you like the rings of power what the hell is wrong with you that show is utter garbage but um you know and the fact that they managed to get a second season oh great yeah i can't imagine what miracle they've got to pull to try and fix that series but i digress you know so you know here most of this is just lcg pack so it's not really telling me much more but again there's a bunch of lord of the rings games that exist where there is just no theme at all like it does not represent the ip at all and you know, that's a disservice, you know, you've got to respect the IP, because otherwise you're just paying money for the sake of it, you know, maybe they're under, I think they're, the problem is when you have a license for a game, you're under contract to produce so much content for that IP, because otherwise you lose it, um, this is prevalent in some of the board game stuff, where like a board game has to come out with this IP every now and again, otherwise you lose it, but it's particularly prevalent in something like the movie industry, I uh, remember the garbage fired earlier this month, um, earlier this year, uh, Madam Web, you know, that, that rubbish movie. Well, basically, Sony have the rights to some of the Marvel properties, you know, including some of the Spider-Man stuff. And if you don't make a, a certain amount of content every now and again, you lose the license. So Sony are basically under this obligation to put out a movie of some sort on something remotely Marvel related in order to justify the fact that it has a license. This is why they are low effort. I mean, Morbius and Madam Web and even Craven looks bad. You know, I mean... All these films are just generally mediocre or garbage at best, and it's just the fact that they know they've just got to put out something to keep the license because they don't want to lose it, and it just means that it's a mess each time. I mean, yes, you occasionally get gold dust from them, but then that's more their animation studios, and that's purely um, into the Spider-Verse and across the Spider-Verse, which are absolutely fantastic but that's animation studios clearly somebody knows what they're doing there but in terms of their filmmaking uh, horrible but you know that's kind of the way it is you know the ip is important and i'd be interested to know your thoughts in the comments as to um i couldn't think of that many off the top of my head but you know ips ip board games where the theme is completely pasted on you know and we're talking big bucks don't worry about small ones you know small ones i'm not too fussed about but cyberpunk 2077 gangs and uh, night city is a pretty big game with an ip to be that sort of dry to it i'd be interested to know some others and i'm sure i'm going to kick myself when you tell me some that i was like oh yeah of course i should have thought of that but you know there's definitely some examples there where it does get misused and and so that's kind of the way to wrap it up when is theme essential i love theme in board games theme draws me back in and i love it when it's present and done well you know even if it's a theme i'm not that interested in i still would at least respect it for representing the theme well and it may be enough to draw me in for a second play but two essential times for me the length of the game the longer the game is, the more the theme needs to be strong, because otherwise I can't justify the time length for the game I'm playing, at least very rarely. There are exceptions to the rule if the mechanics are just that good, but even then, the setting still needs to be something I'm interested in. I mean, people will no doubt, I'm sure, bring up Ark Nova. Ark Nova is a long game. I wish it was shorter, but... 
even if it's not the most thematically rich game in the world, the setting is still something I really love because I love animals. And so I still get immersed in that respect. If Ark Nova was the same mechanics and it was literally brass, you know, basically industrial revolution, building coal mines and stuff, I wouldn't play it. I'd be bored, you know, because I wouldn't care the fact that I'm building a coal mine or some iron railway or something like that. But I do care that I've put a giant panda in my zoo. There is a difference in settings. Uh, same thing for Wingspan versus Wormspan. I don't care about dragons. They're a trope, but birds are cool. I like birds. Wingspan is better, you know, that kind of thing. But the second essential part, IP. If you're going to have an IP in a game, you got to get that theme right because it's a disservice to do it otherwise and it just tricks players and it puts me off a game really hard if you take the IP and just use it as a selling point. Like, you know, a misleading, you know, almost clickbait, basically, to say, look at this big game we're making. It's based on the Warhammer universe and you're putting tiles on the board and moving up tracks. Would you not class that as a betrayal to the license that, you know, when somebody has got the license to a property you really like and then they paste it on something? Does that not just feel like a betrayal to you from a board game publisher? It feels very low effort. So, yeah, length and IP. Two most essential times I think a theme is necessary. By all means, let me know in the comments if you've got any other ideas as to why it should be essential. I'm not interested in discussing the whole thing of whether theme, whether you like theme in the game or not. That's not the idea. But, you know, we're talking, you know, is there a time that theme is essential in a game? And if so, when? You know, when is it for you? And try and think of something different other than the length and the IP thing that I mentioned. Uh, you know, let's see if we can get some other things in the comments. So yeah, that's it for me. I'm going to wrap this one up. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, you know, I'm going to get on with uh, the day. I'm supposed to be playing some extended Stellaris with some friends in a minute, although I still need to edit and submit this, so that's going to be tight. Still want to go to the gym, and I got Valheim tonight, so I've got a bit of a fun day later on, but... At some point, I really do need to get recording on those Moonraker videos. So much time and just not enough time to do everything I want. Oh, well, that's the nature of the beast for a content creator who has a full-time job. It's just how it works. I wish I could do this full-time. It's just never, ever going to happen. So anyway, that's it for me. I'll see you on the next Broken Meeple video. And remember, as always, regardless of whether theme is an essential part of a game for you or not, it's still only a game. So just play what you like and enjoy it. Bye for now, everyone. Take care.